Uh, we have a minute to go, so let me just uh, introduce this. So this is a, a meetup uh, for a network manager community. It's going to be for 55 minutes. But of course, after that, you can go to the work adventure if there will be more to discuss. Um, this is a meetup, so if someone is going to uh, ask uh, to join the team, I will just allow them to, right? I don't have to wait for uh, the, uh, the, uh, your permission, I hope. Um, definitely everyone is uh, uh, welcome to join the discussion. You can join the, the, the discussion by clicking the purple button on the top right corner, uh, share audio video, and you can participate. Uh, I will be then just checking the time and every now and then uh, tell you how much time is uh, uh, is left. But other than that, I will just uh, be here silently out of the video stream. Okay. So here we go. We can start. Have a nice conversation. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Babel. Hi, everybody. Uh, Dil. Oh, hello. Do you want to make an introduction or do you want to say a few words or should I? Please go ahead. Or had... uh, Benjamin, you can also join ah, so, uh, the video chat. But I was just so, uh, checking who is, where is, is here from the team. Uh, Philip, if you want to join. So anyway, welcome everybody. So this is our DEF CONF meet meetup. We had this already in the past years as well. Well, recently it was on, also virtual, but so what we usually do, we just, well, we, we talk whatever we want to discuss. So it seems in particularly interesting if you have any questions or suggestion or things you want to talk about that you raise, raise it and then we can talk about it. Otherwise we don't have much prepared. Maybe I should say, well, uh, ah, well, I should introduce myself and Maybe other people should also introduce themselves. So I'm Thomas. I work at Red Hat on Network Manager. And um, I don't want to call other people out, but Dil, maybe you want to introduce yourself. Sure. Yeah, I also work uh, at Red Hat, and I manage the network management team, so, which are the network manager engineers and also uh, engineers working on some other projects, such as and I'm staying on the network system wall for networking or for Ansible, network system wall for Ansible. Uh, hi, I did, uh, ah, sorry. I'm Beniamino. Uh, I work for Red Hat and I, I also work on Network Manager. Lubomir, who are you? Hello there. Surprisingly, also working on Network Manager, also from Red Hat's Brno office. Um, well, that's about it. That's about it. Yes, maybe I would. Uh, hello, thank you. Uh, I did. Maybe I should say that the, I, I guess the core team who works on Network Manager, we are all on from Red Hat, in case you didn't know. Then there are a few other people in our team, as still already mentioned. And we also have QE. I'm not sure if, if Vlad didn't know if it's fine. But so the people who make Red, uh, Network Manager are mostly at, at Red Hat and here today. So I saw that Lumi already uh, pasted a surprise change. You blew my mind, Lubomir. Hey, so, so yeah, by the way, I'm actually, I'm actually very pleasantly surprised to see Neil around um, because he's, uh, he's commented on our, on a FESCO ticket that's been uh, dealing with the uh, dropping of IFCFG support from future releases. It, it's, uh, it still, Pet Peel here, and uh, Neil Neil pointed us to Cloud in it that uh, that would potentially break when we 
when we if we that, that relies on IFTFG files, it, it seems to be pretty neglected actually because upstream cloud in it actually always sets NM control now in the IFTFG file, so downstream patches it to make it somehow work in Fedora. So yeah, I made look into today actually I looked into what, what could be done today and yesterday to make it work and it seems plausible. I'm not test with passing. I think it works. It needs it needs more testing here. But uh, yeah. I am very happy to hear that, Lubomir. And I am very, very happy to test that if however I, I can. Um if we can get this going uh in, in cloud in it, um then we can roll this out with um F thirty five or F, sorry, F thirty six um cloud in it as well. And um, do you, if it works out, um, do you think we'll see it in CentOS Stream as well? Because like um, CentOS Stream also defaults to, uh, to this, but then reverts it in its in Cloud in it. They have downstream patches to make Cloud in it force it back to the if config plugin and use the old way of doing things. Yeah, so so I I don't know about about CentOS Stream. It might might be that it's it's a bit too too light for. For such an invasive change there, but but then again, the cloud in it has uh, multiple like these backends they call renderers that can be switched, so we can ship the network manager code disabled by default and optionally enable it if anyone anyone needs it. I, I'm not sure whether it's, it's going to be possible to to switch the default. What 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 will it need? Are you a member of the cloud as as IG? Yes, I am a member of the cloud stick and the cloud working group, as well as hyperscale yeah. in in CentOS. And so, like, I actually would probably want to force everything to network manager as much as possible because I like network manager as a network management solution. Like, I was using it. I started using it for my for my um, non wireless devices. Um, uh, I think like 2012, 2013 ish. Like, just. Um, a little bit just before um, I started using CentOS 7 in, in some places, or CentOS 6. Um, and while it was kind of bad in, in 6, it was much better in 7. Um, I think the only thing I'm a little surprised about, and, and this is a little bit of a, a switch in the, in the topic here, but the only thing I'm kind of surprised about is um, how is it, I, I noticed that Network Manager pulls in some parts of SystemD network, but it doesn't actually support reading system D network units. Um, why have you not ever considered adding support for using system D network configuration? Hey, Thomas, would, would you like to, to answer this? Because to, to explain uh, what parts okay. of system D we, we, we pull in, what's relation? Yes, I, I try. Uh, is my sound OK? Hey, it's just Firefox doesn't work. Okay. It's a little distorted, but you're at least mostly understandable. If you have a Chromium browser, please switch to that, because then it'll work better. Uh, I will do that later. I turn off the video. <laughs> so the, the, uh, while we use systemd code, mostly for internal libraries, like the DHCP client and uh, LLDB. But that is kind of just internal. And why didn't you use the configuration format, like the unit files, it's, well, one reason is nobody really suggested it and nobody was working on it. Another reason is that the model is a bit different. For network D, you have kind of three kinds of units, the network file, the net, net dash file, the link file. The network manager that's just combined in the profile. So they are different in that regard. So. Another reason might be that we actually want to go away from different configuration backends because they make everything more complicated. We would rather just have one. Yeah. So I guess the, the reason is nobody implemented it. And it's not planned to do so. This actually this proliferations of various ways to describe network configuration be the there's the network manager key files, IFCFG files traditionally, but also an M state, NetPlan, cloud unit using two different two different uh, schemas to describe network configuration. 
I think OSNet config used by OpenStack is something something else there. Uh, there's been seems to be all around various various uh, pieces of software invested in setting up networking. A lot of effort spent on converting between all these all these formats, and in the end, it seems to me like the only reliable thing there that actually works is slapping an IPv4 address on an Ethernet interface, and the rest has a high risk of being lost in translation. So the reason I asked about the um, systemd network unit stuff is because um, I've, I've heard from people about network manager versus network D where they like how the layered configuration model for network D works. And we don't really have that in network manager. I know that you can drop in mm -hmm. network configuration files into user lib. I believe Thomas told me this uh, a little while ago um, in, an, in, a, um, in a network manager GitLab issue. But it doesn't have the same modus operandi that systemd units do, where you can do layered overrides and the base configuration can remain the same. You do partial partial settings in in Etsy, you ship the main config and user, that sort of thing. Um, and and that seems to be something that um, like to put it bluntly, in the hyperscaler model that you know that I'm working in. This comes in very handy if I'm pre-baking my images to have some basic default setup, and then I only want to have select overrides um, done maybe through Ansible or through a pre-boot boot configuration discovery or something along those lines. Um, that kind of thing seems to be not really supported in Network Manager's configuration model. I think that's where a lot of people tend to ask, like, why don't we support the NetworkD model? Because NetworkD has this layering configuration convention and even though Network Manager supports configuration files at different directory levels and has a precedence, it doesn't support a layering model. So, so what's the use case that, that you actually need this instead of um, so setting up the two, configuration directly? I have two primary use cases. The first is VPN configuration, where I want to set a generic based um, configuration that'll work on machines that I'm sending out to the field, like laptops or or edge devices or whatever. And I want to have a base VPN configuration that goes just to be enough VPN to hit an endpoint. And then it downloads and overrides, maybe sets new credentials or whatever. And that layers on top, still using the same VPN configuration, but will then change to something more unique, like a user password combination or a custom cert or whatever. Um, the second thing is basically always having a factory reset case for fallback network configuration. Um, and this is for edge devices that, so at my workplace, we develop a, an edge device and we're actually in the transition of moving from legacy if up down to network manager as part of one, having better network configuration, and two, distro agnosticism. Um, and one of the things that would be super nice for us is if we could pre-bake like some basic settings that um, that we'll, we can at least say will work in like most cases when it bootstraps itself, and then afterwards um, go on, and then it, the administrator or user or whatever can do partial or full reconfiguration. But in the event that they hit the reset button, we will go back to a state that will always work. Now, Network Manager has some heuristics already to make the second case kind of okay, where like it'll do auto DHCP or whatever, but like. In the auto DHCP case, sometimes it'll do things like um, set certain host name prefix configuration stuff, and like, um, and, and we want to be able to set some of those settings at the base level, and then only have them overridden when specifically requested. So that's basically the two cases that I'm thinking of. And this the second case could also be considered part of like where I'm talking about with using cloud images, where I'm trying to make cloud things like behave a certain specific way, that sort of thing. Um, hopefully that that is comprehensible. But, but it seems like, especially like the reset feature would already be possible with the current, right? Because then you have like your default profile in uh, USR something, and then you're updated. But you, of course, you need to copy everything. Right. So it, like, is that... and then for reset, you remove that from etc. Right. Again. But if the if the system is updated. 
and the, the base defaults change for whatever reason. So for example, if our default name servers that we want everything to hit, if those change, I want those to be inherited. That That's basically the kind of thing I'm talking about, like name servers, net masks, DNS uh, name prefixes, search orders. Like those are the kinds of settings that like right now, the way it works in network managers, you've got a connection oriented thing and you can set a connection config but like that's wholly overridden as soon as you make a new config file in Etsy. Like none of it link go propagates up if it's not set. That's basically what I'm I'm talking about. Sorry if I didn't make that clear. Yeah, I think that's basically like the one additional requirement that, that you probably need. Uh, for for which we need this layer configuration. I, I think the reason why this is not so easy for network manager or easy for network D is because network D, the configuration is read only. I mean, network D only reads it. So it doesn't matter to it when it, when it merges it from multiple locations. And it's actually always a human administrator who edits those files, at least from point of view of network D. Maybe you have a software that writes the override files, but network D doesn't care. It just says, while you or the software, you need to stitch them together in the right. You need to deploy them in a way that they make sense together. It doesn't care. But Network Manager has a DBus API where you can modify a profile. So when you do that, it needs to write out the profile to disk. And then somehow you would have to do this inverse of the merging. And it's not very clear how that would work. That's why when it currently writes a profile to disk, it replaces it wholly and it writes it completely. So with these parts, it would have to write it partially. Or you could say, well, if this is a merge profile, then you cannot write it via, you cannot modify it via DBus API, but that doesn't seem useful either. So I think the problem here is it's not clear how you could write such profiles. And if you disable that, it seems a very useful part of it, you lose as well. So that's fair. It's, yeah, yeah that makes just sense. checking on this, like it seems like the normal copy on write file system use case, like where you, kind of like check any changes but you write to the new profile and everything that's unchanged stays in the old yeah, No, but, but there, there would, uh, it, it would be tough to ensure that the connection is still is still valid. Uh, it, it could be like, uh, well, you, uh, if, you, if you, what you're proposing is to remember what you were cloned from and only write the changed properties. But in, in Neil's use case, uh, it could happen that someone updates the baseline. And then at that point, nobody guarantees that it's going to result in a, in a connection that's that's valid in, in any in any sense. So this this is a tough one. We can, I think we can almost promise you we're not going to help you here because because it would it would mean to compromise the the, the the configuration model here. And what I see as a as a path to deal with this is to push the logic into a client utility, like to have a something that, that takes care of the bookkeeping and just the, let's network manager knows which like uh, the, 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 sends the finished connection the, the result to the network manager so then for the first case that i mentioned for vpn stuff um would it be possible to do something along the lines of straight up splitting out some aspects of VPN configuration so that it could be set up in this in this model like a special case for VPN stuff because that one is particularly painful as it currently is. I don't know. Uh, I, I need to understand the at, at least me. I would need to understand the requirements more. It would it might help unless you've done that already to to file a, a bugzilla and, and explain the technicalities of the, the requirements there, because it's yeah I, th I can't I think this needs some design work or, or consideration I, I can't see how. I I think what would be interesting, for example, if you say, well at least I would like to override the DNS configuration, for example, then you we would need some parts or pseudo profiles where you could modify the DNS configuration and that then gets inherited. So we were kind of discussing that earlier, I mean, a few months ago that what we could, what we already have, like if you, certain 
properties, they can be left at the default value and then they get the default, a, a default value inherited that is configurable. So if you say, for example, well, which property? Um, I'm not sure. For example, the DHCP timeout that is overridable that way. So you leave it at a, you leave that property in the profile to a certain value that says, I allow to be, I'd be the, I'm the default. But then it looks up the default somewhere. So currently that default has to be itself in network manager configuration on disk. But what we were thinking or discussing that there could be a, a base profile that is just linked. You have another profile and your current profile says, I have this base, it's the other one. And then it would look up at that other profile for the default value. And I like that because the base profile as such would also just be a normal profile. There would be no new concept like DNS configuration as a entity that needs to be stored on disk. It would still be only profiles. So I liked that idea. So, but uh, yeah. And regarding like the problem that profiles might get invalid if the base profile is changed, I think that's always a problem that network manager cannot guarantee. Like if someone writes a new file on the file system, it can be invalid because it's not through the API. So I don't see that like why this would be. Yeah, it, it, the thing is like like here like it would be difficult to to well. We, Given the sort of users, the desktop users and the desktop API we provide, who we, who we deal with, it would be difficult to 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 handle the problem. Like suppose someone someone uses, uses their desktops, they have this uh, uh, IT department provided base connection. They use the GNOME control center to modify some aspects of the connection. And then there's there's an there's an update from from their company's IT that changes the baseline, and now the connection suddenly doesn't validate and it disappears, and the user is just baffled as, as to what happened here. They cannot be expected to consult the logs to see to, to look for an error message, and try to resolve the the problem and then restart the reload network manager to see the connection back. Uh, I mean, suppose uh, compared to the systemd who has a, that has a similar concept there that they have uh, unit files and they can they can drop in snippets of unit files that extend or remove things from the from the from the unit, and they can corrupt it as well. And at that at that time, what systemd does it also it ignores the unit and and logs an error message, and hmm. Probably good enough for systemd because their target target audiences are system operators who edit the configuration with a text editor and uh, reload the configuration from shell and then consult consult the journal to see what 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 went wrong. But we can't reasonably expect this from network manager users. Yeah, but but again, like then if the company publishes another invalid profile on the system, even. If there are no overrides, and then it will. But, but, but the thing is, they they don't they don't publish any invalid in the in the first case. They they provide a, a reasonable a reasonable valid configuration. There is just the combined with the previous user changes, it it comes invalid. I mean, we we have a validation there that does thing like. If you have this property set, then you can't have this other property set. You, you set either way, and if if you have both, then then we then we give up. We don't know what to what to do what to do about it. And a situation like this could easily arise. And the thing is, the IT department could have no idea to check whether whether their baseline is going to work with the, with all the all the customer systems, and then the, the user, the, the customer, can't can't possibly know that their changes are going to collide with some future baseline. So nobody is able to to spot an error. Everybody does the right thing and combined it doesn't work. And it's difficult to, to troubleshoot. But in general, like th this w would be opt-in. So like the IT department would need to have some knowledge about this mechanism 
because otherwise they wouldn't use it. So like, like by default, they would publish the configuration to some other location and then n nothing would happen, but only if they publish it in a way that it would be using this base feature, then the users would even change it in this way. So it's, I think, wrong to assume that they don't know this mechanism and at the same time use it. Maybe this mechanism is not used that much because, for example, you cannot, in, currently you cannot configure DNS search if you disable IP, IP method, right? Then it will say profile invalid. But so you could say, well, if the DNS search gets inherited from somewhere else and then suddenly, and then the combination could be again invalid. But maybe this kind of validation is just too annoying and strict. And we should just say, well, if IP method is disabled, then we ignore the DNS search that you that is present. So it doesn't matter when it gets inherited, it will be not considered. So that these merged things would not necessarily result in something broken together, it just ignored. And I guess in many cases that would be good enough, especially like for, yeah, for a DNS search. You use it if you can, otherwise it's fine. Of course that brings then on the other side, we usually want to be very strict and validate, right? And say, well, this profile is wrong. You configured inconsistent things. You can't have it both. But I think it would be solvable. This being so strict about it is also a bit annoying. Like I have a profile. I want temporarily disable IP method. I disable it, then it, then it would say, no, invalid. You still have a, their, uh, a DNS search. And I would say, no, it's fine. Le right. So. I think this would not be such a problem. We should not validate too much. That's what I mean. And then the next option, like if you want to make it easier to set up these valid profiles, you could also provide an API to update the base profile instead of having it updated in the file system. And then the validation would work on the combined profile. Like yes, that's what I meant before. If mm -hmm. those base profile would also just be profiles, so yeah, we well, already have that API. Then, yeah, yeah, my understanding was that those would be like read-only profiles that reside in user share somewhere. No, that's yeah, because yeah, the user lib network D whatever exists, and or not network D, uh, network manager, user lib network manager profile connections, whatever that that path exists, and if you drop files in there, it it, it works, uh, according to Thomas. Uh, but like, it, it, it's not a layering model. It is a full-on whack it with a stick override model, um, which makes things like if the VPN DNS address changes for some reason, uh, which is something that actually just happened at my workplace, um, if it changes, uh, then everyone is screwed until they manually go and update everybody, like all the things mm -hmm. like. That's really that's really the, the the case I'm trying to deal with is in I don't know three three years we've had three different VPN providers and we've had the endpoints change um, and and the only thing that's actually remained relatively the same is the credentials and those would be at the per user level anyway and I would really like for this to work and it doesn't. Hmm. And I'm pretty sure all of you can sympathize with my pain here because I'm pretty sure y'all use VPN uh, at, at Red Hat this way as well. And it is from, from your IT people and it's probably the same kind of problem. Yeah, I think there's still some, there's some opportunities to improve this. I, I think like some other use case where we uh, saw like these inheritance was like, to make sure that system def that there could be system defaults that are available through the API in general, which would be a little bit slightly different where we have maybe like some kind of default profile that's inherited from by any other profile. And then you can change things like uh, the privacy for DHCP requests and so on. And then every new um, profile would use these defaults and so on. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I haven't haven't been fan of of this because I saw some I've seen some value in uh, 
the connection profile being the ultimate description is of what's going to happen, of what's going to be to be configured, not relying on anything else because it makes it makes debugging easier. It, it I thought it makes it easier to keep a mental model of what's going to actually be applied on the interface. Simple, like you do an MS, an, MC, an MCLI connection show, and what you see it's what's going to be applied, not depending on anything anything else on, on the face of moon or networkmanager.conf. It's not it's not exactly true, and they're probably yeah I, I have been wrong before, like, <laughs> but. Um, I, well, I would think that using the run and directory path to export the finalized configuration it actually executes with would be a good way to compromise on that. Like, regardless of whether it's in user, Etsy, or in the or in the home directory or whatever, like, because I know there are some configuration snippets that can actually be in the home directory, um, putting exporting it all out to run for the finalized config, I think would allow you to get that same kind of um, um, uh, ease of developing that mental model of how the final connection works. Yes, I think, I think with, yeah, I think with your point was different. Uh, yeah, yeah, but, but uh, reacting to what, what Neil said, I, I, I agree completely. That the nice thing about about slash run and uh, how it's how it's used currently is that it allows for generators to exist. That there would be the thing that goes in initrd that generates the connection. That would be I think an cloud init does. A cloud, uh, and that's cloud config, sorry, but cloud in it also also does generate configuration that's supposed to go into slash run. Um, probably a thing that just merges key files, validates them, does some reasonable thing with it, dumps it into into slash run, might be a might be a viable viable option here. Not not sure. I need more thought probably. But, uh, I, I like the idea about, about using using the in memory uh, slash run. But, but I think that like these are two different aspects. So I think like what, what you initially said, Lumia, was that uh, you don't like that we have some defaults for profiles in the network manager configuration that are outside of profiles, which is something that I don't like as well. And then Neil was proposing a solution for having multiple places that are the source for the profile by having like the also a representation of the final profile in the file system and using slash one for this. Yeah, but that would also represent the stuff that he's talking about where network manager has implicit settings that you don't know about. Like basically everything would be exported to the run state. Because right now that's not true for, for network configuration even today. Like there's a whole bunch of implicit settings that if you don't set them in the in the key that they'll they'll do, and having those all exported every property that is supported for a config type put into the run exported config means that you can generate a complete mental model of how the configuration actually is set up, and and today we don't actually have that anywhere. I'm saying that even if you don't do my fragments idea. Having the run export would be a really good idea. I see. So the question for the engineers, like, like if you have uh, like some defaults in network manager conf that change something, do we see this in the dbus API and MCLI, the setting, the effective setting, or is this hidden? No, you don't. And so basically, like this would change then. Well, if you change on disk first, in the first moment, nothing happens. You need to reload, and then it gets reloaded and me remembered in in memory of the daemon. But you wouldn't see it from outside what the what was loaded, the network manager conf file. No, no, but but I mean in general, like if I think the network manager conf file, like it supports the method how I think IP addresses, IPv6 addresses are generated, and like yes, you look at no, a new profile. Yeah. Do, do I see in the API? No, you don't. You, in the in the API, you will see the address generation mode is set to default, which means it will look at, it will look at the configuration, but you wouldn't know what it what it looks at at runtime. And actually, it even depends on the device, right? 
which you might say is a misfeature. But you in the network manager conf, you can have different this these defaults they depend on the device. So it's a misfeature because there's not only one default, there are it depends. That's why you cannot just say, well, this this in, in the current way, you could not say it's just this the that's the default value. No. What certainly would be possible to augment to have a profile that has all these values set to their default and then to to on the dbus api to say give me this profile but with the default set to what would be used but you would have to say what would be used on that device because it depends on the device and at the time yeah. or, or we could <laughs> solve half of the problem by by just adding the the information to the active connection the way we do for well, a couple of properties so that when you do an mclic show and the connection is active that you actually see like the ip addresses that were discovered over over dhcp and, and whatnot but the downside would be that, that, that this would only work for active connections but uh, it but it, it would it would it would involve minimal changes to to the to the DBus API. There, just add, add a property. Like here, that's a property that's not in the connection profile, but still takes effect when when uh, when things are when the connection is active. Of course, yeah, we wouldn't answer the question like, what would happen if I activated this. Yeah, so basically we have now three problems for challenges. But like one would be like the layout configuration in general, one would be API, uh, a way to change defaults through the API, and the third one is to actually see the effective profile even in the way it's currently. So Neil, why I ask you before about the the cloud sig is that I'm sort of afraid about how the cloud in it think uh, would be tested because it's in, it's in difficult. There are there there are ton, tons of of various cloud providers. I certainly don't have access to the majority of them, and I I, I was wondering if uh, if I could roll an a package or or, or an image with uh, yes. with the updated cloud in it. Is it possible yes. to ask CloudSeq, like, hey, tell me if it, yep. if this works or if it breaks down in, in some, some other cloud? Yes. Yes to all those things. Actually, the easiest thing to do is if we can, uh, if you once you have it, um, we can ship it into, into Rawhide and have it generate the images. And, mm -hmm. and then it will just get uploaded. And uh, we can talk to David Duncan and Dusty Mabe uh, and get access to all the different cloud providers that actually test them. We can even include it into a test week. Um, that's probably actually the right course of action is to, we have a test tape for the cloud version, uh, the cloud edition, and let's, we can just roll that into there and make sure everything works. But we can also do just straight up quick smoke testing to make sure like all the basic stuff works. Like I can also produce custom images for my internal OpenStack stuff at work, all that sort of thing. Like I can make sure that we can make sure that it works. Um, just. Once you file an issue on the cloud sig issue tracker and ask for that, and we will we'll we'll take care of it. Yeah, I was thinking if I if I should do this, uh, I wanted to do at least some testing before I submit this upstream. Uh, so so yeah, I, I will be able to provide an RPM. That, um, I would submit it upstream, but make it a draft PR initially, and mm -hmm. then because then that gives them the opportunity to review it, and, and we can and, and if they have feedback you want to get that early mm -hmm. and then we can just we can kind of keep going in parallel for both of those because i would like this to be in and test uh, in done released and out um basically as quickly as possible um so the easiest way to do that is to parallelize everything and so oh yes um, i'm afraid of testing. afraid of breaking things to the point they are not testable well actually no, don't worry about it they the cloud in it upstream has a has a very strong test suite that they run for PRs on on the upstream project, so <laughs> you should be fine. Oh, that's cool. Because quite quite, quite honestly, more more concerned as far as cloud in it goes. 
concerned about accidentally fixing something instead of breaking something because it seems to be <laughs> there's some question of the things there. Well, so the do people actually? Sorry, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. I was just going to say that the the cloud init uh, cloud init uh, Red Hat maintenance has been the nicest way I could put it is subpar for the past ten years. Um, what is it? Yeah, like so. I, I don't know what quick good yeah, lock, and I said to me that did uh, good things there. <laughs> well, so no, the, the what I mean by from the maintenance perspective is that um, if you look at the cloud init package in RHEL, you will see that there's dozens of patches to change the behavior very significantly. Um, the, these patches also wind up in the Fedora package from time to time as well, and they rarely go back up to upstream, hmm. like, at all. Is um, it because the upstream requires a CLA and <laughs> not everyone's happy Red, to sign it? Red Hat signed, this, Red Hat signed the CLA many, many years ago. <laughs> okay. So that's already been taken care of because the CLA, uh, because CloudInit was originally was originally written to support Eucalyptus, and then later OpenStack. OpenStack actually requires CloudInit for being able to boot images in the first place. So they they got over that hump a long time ago. Um, but there was some antagonism because this also happened around the same time that Red Hat was using Upstart. There was some antagonism um, between Red Hat and, and Canonical long ago about various things, and I don't really want to say too much about it because I'm not supposed to. But like, but because that happened back then, um, there was a lot of demotivation on the Red Hat side for contributing to through these projects. And um, when and, and combined with the Corios acquisition a few years ago, um, they wound up uh, a, a, the shift in focus for a lot of the people that would ordinarily be trying to make Cloud Bootstrap work with Cloud in it correctly they all decided to say, well, we're going to try to do everything with Ignition, even though Ignition's not generally compatible with most cloud providers' infrastructure. They're not generally compatible with most um, VPS providers' setup models and things like that. Um, there's this, just been this like weird mental split when it comes to how they think about it. And the result is cloud and it's gotten a lot less than stellar maintenance over the years compared to some of the other parts of the network of the of the cloud stack that that matters like so it i'm hoping that that trend will reverse now that um that people care a lot more about the cloud again especially the public cloud where things are considerably less flexible when it comes to like what kind of tools you're allowed to use to be able to get the to get systems booting and running like you can't really use ignition well in for example openstack or aws or whatever Without having to somehow stub and bootstrap externally through some other means, and and that makes things a little painful. Um, so, Cloud and it's here to stay, but it is a canonical project. But my experience is that they're nice people. I mean, they and they they actually do a lot of work to make sure that the projects that they do develop, like Cloud and it, have a good test apparatus to go with pull requests and things like that. Oh, their test suite is is stellar. Uh, so yeah. the unit test suite is in, I, well, I don't write Python really, uh, and I had never never used yeah. the Python before, so so I, I was I was very impressed actually. <laughs> yeah, no, they, and they also have an in, they have a very comprehensive integration test that's used by a tool mm -hmm. that they call um, Spread that they wrote mm -hmm. for originally for testing SnapD, but they also use it for a lot of other things. And what it does is it can connect to cloud providers, boot machines up with it'll build build images or packages or whatever. And then it'll boot machines up and use that content to test it. So like they can do all kinds of pre-baked steps. They can orchestrate cloud providers with it. Um, and and you, like if you look at the mirror or SnapD or and I think also cloud in it, you'll see these like hundreds, dozens of spread lines where they're testing every single permutation and every single configuration on every single cloud provider that they support. So like they are very, very good with testing to an extreme degree that I am really shocked about. So I wouldn't be that worried if you sent, if you think it works with your unit test, send the pull request and let them look at it. it. The worst that they can do is say, oh, you missed this little thing and here, go fix it here and there. Here's some suggestions or whatever. That's not the end of the world. It's fine, right? And we're gonna ship it in parallel in Fedora and, uh, and, and go from there. Okay. 
That's cool. So Stanislas, do you want, would you like to introduce yourself or ask a question yeah. or anything? Yeah, so uh, my name is Stanislas. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm really happy to, to, to join you and, and listening to you. Um, so my main question will be uh, regarding the main features on which you are working on currently. Uh, is there some, uh, let's say some challenges uh, more uh, related to Wi-Fi, let's say, related to the Wi-Fi uh, handling of Network Manager? Is there some main challenge on which you're working on or something that is coming on the future? Is there? I thought, well, apart from, uh, well, uh, what was there? The, the WPA3, well, some new, yeah, some new key exchange algorithm. Wi -Fi, yeah, the Wi-Fi 6E, I know, uh, I don't know if there was something specific done on in the network manager side, for example. Well, I think, well, it, it mostly boils down to adding a property to express um, the, well, the key exchange algorithm or the, what else is there. Because the crux of supporting Wi-Fi basically lies with WPS applicant, right? Uh, we, we, we merely bookkeepers here. We, we, we just keep the configuration and send it, send it out to supplicant and that's, that's about it. I think so, something that I'm missing is for users to easily automatically migrate from WPA2 to WPA3 for four of us that support us, because that, that's something mm -hmm. that needs to be done by hand specifically. I guess, I guess it would be nice if um, Network Manager recognized WPA3 is available for this access point and then starts defaulting to this in the future to make sure it's, uh, it can benefit from the security benefits from then on. <laughs> yeah, that's a fair point. Also, I do have a mental note to to look at the, the new, well, new, it's a year or two, I think, already, since it's a supported and supplicant to support the device provisioning protocol for IoT devices. Well, we do we do WPS push button. Now, I, I don't think anyone does it anymore, but uh, and I haven't really looked into the device provisioning, but I think it's a sort of sort of works a similar way, right? To, to provision a Wi-Fi device that doesn't have a a keyboard to en enter enter a password on. I don't know if anyone has more insight into into this. I don't, I, for me, I don't really have a lot of details about the uh, DPP device provisioning protocol, but I know that it always requires some kind of uh, third-party uh, application, some kind of application in order to uh, to, uh, uh, to to translate the information to the uh, clients which want to connect on it. Uh, so that that's just all I know about the how it's worked really. I don't so know whether some methods where IoT devices get their configuration, I think, encoded in the length of some packets that are sent as broadcast unencrypted or something. So basically, like if you want to configure your light bulb, then you have an app and then it sends some kind of packets in some broadcasting way unencrypted that. Yeah. Uh, encode something indirectly. I forgot the details. I'm not sure if this is anything that's officially. Yeah. I have no idea what the, what the like market situation is right now. I, probably the cheaper devices probably they tend to do like they just run an access point themselves, and you you connect the rest of your the network to it, right to to, to the bulb or not. I, mean, I I haven't seen it. My my bulbs don't have access point in it. Thankfully, and and I don't know if there are devices in the wild that actually use DPP. I guess like if you have an access point, it seems like it's even the more advanced stuff than like some device that cannot even do that and still needs to be configured somehow. Uh, 
I think currently we don't work. I mean, Wi-Fi was not on much a priority for us at Red Hat. I mean, compared to other things. So it, it didn't get as much attention as it maybe should. I must say it works well enough for me. One feature I always thought would be really nice for enterprise Wi-Fi is some certificate binning where we would remember, well, that we saw a certificate and then trust it based on that. Where probably the most work happened with Wi-Fi, well, I, I think we did something to, su to support uh, WPA3. WPA so that was a bit of work, but where a lot of work happened was actually for IWD. That was not really done by us. There are the, there is the Intel, the, the people who work for Intel and who work on IWD, they contribute uh, the code to it. So I know that, well, I read that people are using IWD with Network Manager and it seems to work for them. I don't know. I think uh, another thing would be seen as warming from Wi-Fi to wired network at home or in corporate networks. So when are we switching to IWD in Fedora? Oh, we're not. No? Uh, it seems to me like uh, at least at least if, if I were to decide that WPS applicant has both healthier upstream maintenance, it's a more active project, uh, the, the code base probably of higher quality to feature feature entries better. I mean, the supplicant seems to be better in about every aspect to me. It baffles me. Why would anyone consider IWD? What, why, why did IWD? What? Now I'm confused. I thought the reason IWD was written was because supplicant was in bad shape. Okay, well, but it was not. Well, that's what I said, but uh, I, I can't, can't see how what their arguments would be. It's an old project. I mean, hmm. but I think that's what a supplicant is where most of the development happens. And the feature range is much higher there. I I can't see a compelling reason. That why would we why would we switch? Well, I, I can agree that supplicant is not that actively maintained. I would wish that there are some that more I don't know people who really know what they do about Wi-Fi would improve things because Wi-Fi doesn't work that well for me with supplicant. I must admit. But we also use supplicant for MaxSec and for 802.1x authentication. So we wouldn't just completely drop it. So now we have, we already, we already need supplicant. So it's not very clear that it would be a win to use uh, IWD for Wi Fi. Yes. And, and, also, uh, uh, sorry, the, the integration between uh, network manager and the WP supplicant. Uh, I mean, they have uh, compatible models like uh, network manager stores the configuration and the configures WPS applicant. With IWD, there is a overlap because IWD also wants to store the configuration, network manager also. So it's not clear how well they integrate together. Yeah. Well, that's maybe the, the best point, yes. And also that IWD wants to do a lot of things that network manager already does which is fine if you don't use network manager, but together they can, supplicant is just a tool who does the lower, lower layers and for network manager. Yeah. yeah. Oh, there's a question in the chat by Jan about uh, Wi-Fi direct support. And I think we, well, we do support it somehow, <laughs> network manager. And yeah, about the, about the upstream health of the project, I, he, I th I was concerned about LWD that uh, it's basically Intel only project. It's a seems like an I an IH case here, whereas sub WPS applicant has a very wide wide uh, range of contributors. It's and, and users as well. It's used in in Android. Uh, it's used in Windows at least for the for the wired cases. You can, you can do it. Not, not sure if, if for wireless. Um, so th that seemed to be a, a project that, that's, that's truly collaborative here. Uh, I, yeah, but I, but I think I'm not. I, I think nobody of us uses RWD here. So if there were if, if there's something great about it, we wouldn't notice. So so we would we would like to hear if uh, if uh, if yeah if it if it solves a, some problems that uh, that supplicant has. 
I mean, I don't know anything. I was just every people keep asking me about like why we why we don't use IWD, and I don't have an answer. So that's why I asked. Yeah, the real question is yeah, why would we? So yeah. Jan was mentioning uh, Wi-Fi direct peer-to-peer -peer in the chat. And yes, I forgot about it, of course. <laughs> uh, Benjamin Berg contributed all the, the, co all, the so all the code for that. I actually don't use it because I don't have such hardware, but it probably works. Yes, it works. Uh, and uh, one notable user of this is a GNOME network displays, which allows you to share your screen to a TV, for example, via Miracast. It works very well. So is Miracas, is it supported by a Fire TV stick or something to try this, or is it only available in some TVs? Let me interrupt you just for a second. So the time for the discussion is up. But because we have a half an hour before the next session, if you want, you can continue here for a while. Uh, or you can go to the work adventure and continue there. It's up to you, really. So it's more fun here. Hmm? It's so more fun We just here? started. Oh, oh, OK. So I will let you know like 10 minutes before the beginning of the next session. And then, yeah, like that. Cool. Thank you, Pavel. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. I anyway wanted to say, even if we don't, if if there is no time here to discuss something, or you, we anyway can always meet, like on the on the ILC channel and on the mailing list, right? So whatever, whenever you have a question and you thought the, there was no time or not the opportunity or we missed it, then please reach out. Right? It's not. And I think we also plan forever to have some kind of public video meeting, everyone, in a while. Maybe like we just start this year, like we did this now for January, January, and now February we will maybe announce something on the mailing list and have some like non-conference related meetup. Ah, I didn't know that was planned, but we talked about it half a year ago, and it's a good idea. Yeah, I thought you told me that it was planned. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> No, I like it. It's a good idea. Yes, we should have like maybe every two months or so. Network Manager is a really nice. Uh, Jan mentions that he's us they're using it in their network embedded devices very happily, and I want to just echo that statement. Network Manager is surprisingly awesome for embedded stuff, and I don't think people give it enough credit for how much how well it works, even in low resource environments or even in slightly static environments like servers. It does a really good job doing the stuff. Deal. Take a Thank note. You. I will. That's good to hear. I think in Fedora, it's also well, some people are working on using it on the Pine phone. I think it's yeah. good. I not notice the, the shift in embedded. I, actually, my phone, it runs Ubuntu with a Kahneman there, but uh, more re and, and, and Ofo, no? And I just noticed the shift that uh, the today's generation of, of Libra phone speed, be it Purism or the Pi phone, they tend to prefer network manager with modern manager once modern manager got support for voice calls. And I'm happy about this shift. I need to, need to upgrade my phone. Plasma Mobile um, in Fedora as it is being brought in, is being brought in to use Network Manager and Modem Manager. We are not bringing in the Ophono stack. We are not dealing with Conman, because all that crap can, is sucks. I, well, I, this is I, IWD into the same bunch. <laughs> yeah. So in a previous life, I actually worked in embedded, in embedded development, especially with a cellular-enabled device. So I've actually worked with both Ophono and Modem Manager, and I vastly prefer Modem Manager. Hello, Alexandro. Alexander, I I remember you. <laughs> so I've been I've also been subscribed to the network manager and modem manager mailing list for like years now because of my previous job, and so I uh, I, I followed the progress of that well, and I'm really 
really happy to see how much advancement has come in supporting cellular stuff um, in that stack. Uh, Network Manager has two backends for, well, to talk to Modem Manager and to Ofono. And there is no problem with the Ofono backend. It's just, I never saw a bug report. I never saw anybody using it, which- That's because Ofono oh. is buggy all by itself. <laughs> oh yeah, I, I once, uh, once, uh, I once run it. I noticed it being like broken to the point it would just crash at the time you try to use it. And it have been broken for two years straight. So at, at which point, oh no, that was a settings plugin. We do have a, uh, we, we did have an Ofono settings plugin where you just delegate the connection to Ofono because Kothman, Kohnman, Ofono and AWD all like to store configuration as well as opposed to being stateless, which made it pretty obvious that nobody's, nobody's using this, that, that, uh, that uh, a crasher bug that always happened got unnoticed for years. Not, not sure about the, about the modem backend there, but it could be in a, in a similar situation. Alexander, you're still muted. We can't hear you. Yeah, you're muted. Can't hear you. It might have selected the microphone. Yes, yeah, hold on. There yeah. we go. Now we can hear you. Mm -hmm. I was going to say that most of the phones uh, that have been using uh, a phone for phone management have been including their own patches on top of like the generic phone. So it has never been like the Ophono as Modern Manager is. Uh, it's always been Ophono plus these uh, tens of patches that they didn't bother to try upstreaming because uh, probably maintaining uh, Ophono is not uh, a priority for Intel anymore. So, yeah. I'm really happy to, to, for the change of, of lots of different phones uh, using Modern Manager. And actually giving a talk about that in Fosdem next week. Which I, I don't have to attend that. I already recorded it, uh, so I mean, and I think it's uh, good enough. <laughs> um, well, if it's if it's going to be scheduled absurdly early in the morning, I'd be happy to see the recording where I don't have to be in, uh, in the afternoon, like two p.m. European time. Ah. Oh well, then I might actually be able to do it because that's like morning-ish here. So. Like this, this event starts at three a.m. my time. I'm not going to be awake at three a.m. Oh, and this this particular meetup starts when I make breakfast, so I had to make breakfast a little early and then show up to here. So like, that's. Hey, uh, I'm wondering if we could drop the off on a modern backend, but UB ports like the what used to be Ubuntu phone might still be using it, and they still crank out new new releases. Well, they didn't uh, include it longer. I mean. It was Okay. Can it can it hear hear you a little bit? Just noise coming out. Your your audio is, is is like Thomas's at the beginning. Are you using Firefox? If you're using Firefox, switch to a Chromium browser. That will work better. I am very sorry. Anyway, with the Ofono code, yes, I guess we would like to drop it, but it's very hard to know whether anybody is actually using it and would miss it. So we, if anybody, if you know anybody using it, then we would like to hear it. All I know is people are trying to get away from it. Is it so UB ports? But I'm I'm not sure if. Uh, Alexander meant to say it's no longer the, the case, or it, I'm very curious what he, what he was to say. <laughs> Just write in the chat, Alexander, if you uh, response about about the the Ubuntu thing if you had. Oh, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, I, I just said that they, they added not long ago, and that I don't think it's a good idea to, if to remove it. Um, I mean, I would ask them. Hmm. What they're going to do with it. Um, but just to move it. I mean, if, if it's not going to be, not going to be. Uh, it's not like we have changed API in the manager or the integration with network manager since 10 years ago. I mean, it's, the integration with modern manager has been like quite simple since for the last 10 years. Um, 
So I don't think there is any big change related to modern management in network manager that would lead us to say, okay, we can we can remove or we should remove all. I mean, I don't think it makes sense if if it's not a maintenance burden, uh, which I don't. I don't think it is. So. Quite, quite the opposite. I, I got a couple, a couple of years, uh, some years ago, on Fosdem for for fixing the, the build. <laughs> well, the build, the crasher back there. So if this happens again, it's it's great to keep it around. So I guess if there's nothing else, then we can also conclude the meetup. Thank you, thank you everybody for joining. It's, it's been a really pleasure to to see the actual faces uh, instead of the, the names. <laughs> yeah, for sure we will continue on DevConf US in the summer, and maybe in the meantime we will publish something, just like just a uh, video meeting every now and then you will learn on the mailing list. Yeah, you should do regular community meeting things uh, because you guys do releases quite often with a lot of new features and stuff. And it'd be, it'd be great to be able to, you know, have an avenue for people to give feedback or talk about whatever or bring up stuff, things like that, because uh, it feels a little Right now, it feels a little disconnected aside from here. Um, and I think having more of these kinds of things would be great for for network manager. And it may also help with changing the perception of like network managers, like kind of, you know, if you if you read um, our Linux, it's a broken pile of trash that doesn't ever actually do anything. And you, it, I'm going to use my old if config scripts for till the end of days uh, because network manager is a not good or whatever and not doing anything so like yeah like the, the idea of community meetings and having an avenue for people to you know see you know the people that are working on it have them regularly talk about like what's going on i think that would be really great perhaps it's just broken on arch linux you tried to install it but they couldn't so i have no idea if it works there yeah it's arch <laughs> I think that's a good point that we should uh, do better community work in the sense, well, the mailing list should be more alive. The IRC channel should be more alive. We should discuss more on those channels. That is especially an invitation to everybody. If you have anything you would like to bring out that you send an email and not think, well, wow, nobody cares. No, actually, it's good when we discuss more in public. Yeah, um, speaking of IRC stuff, so there's this whole larger trend of, of matrix and stuff. Um, uh, are you guys going to set up a matrix room? Uh, or if you're interested in having a matrix room, I could also help set up the matrix room and have it plumbed in through the IRC one so that people can have a nice uh, matrix experience and stuff. Because like Fedora is doing the whole matrix thing. And OpenSUSE, CentOS, uh, uh, lots of other free software projects like Pipewire and stuff, they're, they're making that, that move over to matrix as well. Um, Sounds running? interesting. So I was still waiting for Fedora to that they go public to try it. So yep, that's already been done a while ago. Um, go to chat.fedoraproject.org and sign up with your FAST account, and you'll automatically get a matrix ID on the Fedora IM namespace, and you can join Fedora Project uh, matrix rooms uh, as well as other matrix rooms on other matrix servers. Oh, nice. So, does um, the, the IRC bridging work? Like, can I can I yeah. keep using an IRC client just as usual and just set up some sort of bridging there? So, yeah, if if you want to live on the IRC side, um, if a matrix room is set up to be plumbed through, which is the technical term for bridging, plumbed through to an IRC room, then the two endpoints are connected and they will be fully federated with each other. And people who are on the matrix side will show up as IRC users on the IRC side. People are on IRC will show up as matrix users on the matrix side and so on. So like that all can be set up. All of the current Fedora rooms, meeting rooms, 
um, community chat rooms, all those things are already set up. Yeah, so Jan, and then Libera chat is a portal room, it is dynamically generated and is constricted to IRC specific rules. If you have a um, an actual matrix room and you plumb it in through an, to an IRC room, you get two extra advantages. The first is the, uh, the room name identifier is static and discoverable um, because it'll show up in directory searches and things like that. And it can be used with the matrix.2 um, uh, URL thing so people can click through it from a web browser and whatever and they'll get that experience. The second thing is um, when it is set up that way, the IRC, the um, the rich information stuff gets seamlessly translated correctly back and forth between IRC and Matrix. So, for example, if somebody um, if somebody posts a, a image or whatever, it turns into a reference URL for the IRC side. URL short uh, like um, it, it, if you post too long of text, it'll turn into a paste bin or whatever. Like all those things like correctly work. Um, and people who don't necessarily have um, IRC registration, but they have a matrix ID, which it requires registration to have one, um, they can still get into the room because you can configure it to allow MX IDs through without allowing unregistered IRC NICs through. That's actually how all the Fedora rooms are set up now. Um, and, and that can only really be done if you've got plumbing through between a, a native matrix room and an IRC room on the other end, because then they get static references and all kinds of fun stuff that makes the IRC um, chancer rules and stuff work correctly. Um, uh, Till, if you want to talk to um, Kevin Fenzi, he can actually tell you a lot about how to set that kind of stuff up. Um, or uh, Nick Bobet, NB, he will also be able to tell you. Like those two have been doing a lot for the Fedora rooms. Um, I can set. Uh, I set up the Matrix native rooms for the RPM ecosystem. And if you'd like me to help you set up the ones for the network manager, feel free to let me know and we can work that out. Yeah, thank you very much, Neil, for the offer. We will get in touch. Okay, then. Bye bye. And maybe see you in the Matrix next time. Bye. Bye, bye everybody. Take care. Bye. Yeah, bye.